Thank you for joining us today on this episode of MSP 1337, a podcast dedicated to helping MSPs and their clients navigate cybersecurity. I'm your host, Chris Johnson, and before we get started, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, BCIO Toolbox. If you're looking to strengthen your client relationships, improve retention, and shorten long sales cycles, check out VCIO Toolbox, the strategic account management platform that helps MSPs get closer to their clients. To find out more, head over to vciotoolbox.com. Now on with the show. Welcome everybody to this episode of MSP 1337. I'm joined today by Steve Alexander of MSP Ignite. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. Hey, so uh, as we as we know at this point, these are raw conversations. Sometimes the topics come out of nowhere. Uh, this week's topic is there's five domains in NIST, and they're kind of the five domains that everybody talks about across almost any framework. And so today, Steve and I, uh, we're talking about the areas that MSPs are really strong, but at the same time knowing that there's some areas that we need to spend time on in order to ensure that when the threat actors are successful, we are prepared to respond. So Steve, uh, I'm not, this isn't rehearsed. What's the one domain that you think MSPs are really good at, or maybe two? Well, I, I think protect they're really good at because after all, we, we're born in an age when we just find tools to, to protect our clients, right? As Absolutely. Long as every, time, every time we identify a hole, we find another tool. Or every time a vendor creates a tool and then identifies the hole that that tool fits, they sell us on it and we buy it. And eventually we start deploying it to everybody. And those aren't necessarily bad things, but I think right. that's the easiest as an MSP is protect. Buy the well, tools and put them in. Well, and I think protect is also one of those areas that when we think about the beginning of computers, at least in the sense of, say, early, late 90s, early 2000s, we were already poised to have you deployed antivirus on the machine. Like that was a requirement, right? Like, so we already started with a mindset that says, if you have a computer, you better put something on it to protect the computer. That's a great point. And, and of course, you know, some of us have been around long enough when the early days, we, we weren't connected to anybody else. It didn't matter as much, right? But as we, as we grew into that world of ubiquitous internet and one giant network all connecting the world together, it became a bigger issue. Right. It's the, if you plug it into the internet and some things haven't been done first in that protect category, there's a real good chance you'll never get any further. And if you think about it, the same thing applies to, to identify comes mostly from the tools, right? Now the detect piece, I guess the, as tools mature, we're detecting better. Right. I think, in fact, I would say that with products like Autotask, ConnectWise, some of these other um, vendors that Ninja RMM that have the RMM products that come in and say, I found this. Um, I detected that this is on your network, but not only did they were able to detect that something was there, they were very easily able to say, and it's this machine running Windows 10, et cetera. And you're like, hey, I can capitalize on that. I can put that into my monthly reoccurring revenue. And hey guys, thanks for buying from PC Mall or wherever we still captured the, the reoccurring revenue. Thank you. I love that you said auto test, but for our friends at Data, we better say Data and Data RMM. Fair, fair point. <laughs> so for friends that are listening, absolutely. It is, it is the Data and the... So the, the point being is that there are RMM tools that date back to the early 2000s, right? And those tools gave us the ability to go, I see you have 10 devices on your network. I'm going to capitalize on that. But more importantly, I'm going to protect those devices. I want to make sure you're pro productive and efficient with those devices. But fast forward, uh, I think um, almost 20 years, 15 years. So we'll look at like uh, 2016, 2017 and go, that's when ransomware really got big, right? Like that's when things were bigger than it's been just encrypted. It's like, I can't just get my data back unless I pay this ransom. And so our, our friends like Datto and some others came in and said, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. Like if you can restore the data that's not been encrypted yet, you're back in business. You don't have to pay the ransom. So we did. And I think it was said best by Brian Sulo who said, and then we as MSPs coasted. Now we're here. Today is 2021. 2020, we saw some big, you know, headlines with regards to what, uh, you know, data exfiltration looks like. 
and not really understanding yet what they might do with that data or what might they, they might do with the exploits that are getting into these systems. So where do we go now? And I think you said this earlier, we need to focus on two pretty critical categories. One is how do we respond to that? And then the other one is what does recovery look like? And do we have in our minds, you know, something to work off of? Because I think one thing that comes to my mind all the time, oh, my cybersecurity insurance, that's why I have it. I'll recover just fine. I think that's true. But I think as MSPs, lazy is the wrong word, but we've, we've become complacent as, as the industry grew in, well, everything we can buy a tool for means less labor. We don't need to. And of course, we all look at, we preach it too to our members, look at the profitability for your managed service clients on a month by month basis. We have some predictability to the labor that we're normally going to put out there for any client until catastrophe strikes, right? Yep. Because up until now, and, and AI may change this over time, but up until now, identify, detect, and protect pretty much automated processes if you have the right tools in place. As soon as you flip over to having to respond and recover, that's, that's really manual labor. That's really us putting our heads and hands into this and working towards it. And what's the one thing we all try and do? Make sure we balance out how much labor we need based on the amount of money we're taking in every month so that we're profitable. Right. We're, we're, you're describing that when I put together my, my cost model in my spreadsheet, and I talk about my 85 cents here, my dollar five there with regards to whether it's antivirus or, or backup of five, it, it doesn't really matter because we, we have a pretty good understanding of those fixed costs that we spend every month. And we know that if I take this product out and put a different product in, I'm still doing it based on a similar cost structure that while it may affect my percentages of margin a little bit, by and large, it's not impacting my overall profitability because I can adjust. What you're describing, I think, is bigger than just the two categories of respond recover. It's across that whole five domains and with regards to that FTE, what are the resources that are going to be consumed as I embrace this idea that I'm going to bring in a SOC solution, whether it's outsourced or in-house. I'm bringing in a new uh, AV that just happens to not have a dashboard that's included in the other stack, but I'm just so impressed with its new next gen or EDR. And I did air quotes because that's what I wanted you to know is air quotes. Um, but you know where I'm coming from, right? Like we are battling this every day, new product, new service. How does it impact me as an MSP and the resources that I have, which are obviously very finite. And our vendors are like, hey, I'm going to offset. I'm going to provide you some some value add that includes uh, spend less time on me. The pro and the big problem is, I mean, we in this industry, we've been so conditioned to, to well, I don't care what your target margin is, right? My target margin is 60% on managed services. So, okay, if I'm going to say that I need to add $25 a month to my tool stack to have all my security solutions put in, let me just make sure that I, I figure out a price that works for that 60% margin. But we never go back and say, wait a minute, what about the labor that's going to be involved? Now that we're now that we're testing more, kind of in a COVID world, this is mm -hmm. ironic. Now that yeah. we're testing more, we're bound to find more. Right. Okay. If we find more, who's going to look into it? Who's going to make sure it's something we could dismiss? Who's going to take the action we need to take to remove it or quarantine or whatever we have to have happen to it? And that's typically a, a higher level engineer than we're used to having. And certainly right. a higher level engineer that we're used to having sitting around with the time to address these types of things. So I keep quoting Brian Sulo, but this is just, I have to, I have to include this. So we got to talking about consulting with our clients, right? And so by and large, managed services says you're getting X all-inclusive and when all-inclusive, I mean, like they know what the stack is, but they're not paying extra as things fluctuate. The user cost per user is going to relatively stay the same unless we introduce something new. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we say you're the guinea pig, we give you a pilot, whatever it might be. But the problem is most MSPs have been using that account management piece, or we'll call it VCIO piece. If they've been doing it, they're way ahead of a lot of the other MSPs out there. 
But if they've been doing it and giving it away, good luck trying to transition into the security services space and get away with charging for that time. But what you're saying, I mean, we're, we're both saying this, you can't have both and get the quality that you need if it's not going to have a value add that's recognized by both the MSP and the client. And I'll, I'll defer to, I'm not going to tell you that you have to be financial in, in this transaction, but there is a transaction happening where client X is getting more of my time. And similarly, the value isn't necessarily tied to a product or a service. It's again, tied to a participation requirement that they have to commit to. The other thing about it is there, there's so little planning on what needs to be done on the, on the respond recover side. Um, but, but even where it comes into labor on any one of the five areas, we don't really sit down and say, oh, wait a minute, let's create a project for what happens. I always use this simple example of what happens when we let one of our engineers go. Right. We have a project for that. And everyone raises their hand in, when I say this in a presentation and say, oh yeah, 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 we, got a, we have a project. And yeah, we, we, we make sure that I can't get into anything and we do this and we do that. Do you notify the client? You're just, no, 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 we don't do that because we're still living, we're still living in the 1990s when we're afraid people are gonna look at us as small, too small to handle their business sure. and we have too much turnover and therefore we're gonna hide the fact that someone left us right. and, leave it up to, and leave it up to the bad guys, if you will, to notice on LinkedIn that this guy that used to be uh, a, a network engineer at XYZ MSP is now not. And oh, by the way, he lists all these people that used to be his clients that are connections. And now all I have to do is call those clients and claim I'm Chris Johnson from right. XYZ. And I, I noticed something, I need some help connecting on your server. Can you go in there and I'll walk you through getting me connected? It's that simple, right? For the imposters out there to jump in and call, wreak havoc on the network no matter what tools we put in place. And, and no matter what we call it, right? It doesn't have to be a project. It's a workflow. It's an offboarding ticket. I mean, Correct. there's so many things that you could describe. Well, it. I think, policy. Yeah. Uh, uh, you I, know. You're, you're describing an area where I think we get in trouble because that's not the fun part of our jobs, right? Like I think about sitting down and saying, okay, if you hire somebody, most of us actually have some level of workflow that's pretty dialed in because we had to hire them. So even if it wasn't a workflow before I hired you, I just stepped through the exercise of some workflow to get you into my, into my office, right? I think that that's an interesting uh, conundrum that we have because when we look at the offboarding process, none of us want to do it. None of us want to do most process if you really think about it. True. You know, as you said, you, I, I love what you just said. It's not the fun part of our job. We also don't look at it as, as a part of our job that makes us money. But in right. actuality, it does. It makes us money because once something does happen and we have a process to follow, we also have the comfort of knowing we planned on this happening X number of times a year. We built it into our model that this will happen X number of times a year or once every three years to every client or whatever number you want to put to it that we need to build this in, right? right? Or know we're billing for it and that's okay too, but we wanna be efficient if we're billing for it and make sure the client doesn't feel like we're running around with no knowledge of how to respond. I had this um, conversation recently with a, a relatively large prospect in the construction space. And the questions were surrounding you know, wanting to engage CISO services, cyber leadership services, they kept referring to fractional CISO and VCISO, and they kept using them interchangeably. And I finally asked them the question, I'm like, you said virtual, you said fractional, which one do you really mean? And he goes, well, I want both. And he explained to me what he wanted. He's like, I get that your company is going to provide us with these cybersecurity services, quite honestly, it might as well be managed services, right? So whether it's a tool that's doing SOC services or some other guidance around uh, risk frameworks, whether it's compliance manager or some other tool to help me map to a framework or a set of controls um, versus fractional CISO, which is more about me time, right? You want you want Chris to be uh, in the room either virtually or physically, but you're, you're guaranteeing 
some level of participation with me on a, on a Zoom or some other call on a weekly or monthly basis, and, and we agree upon those terms, that is billable time, right? So there's, I'm finite in that regard. I can't, I, hey, all of my clients, we're all going to get on on Thursday at two o'clock. Make sure you can join. I can't do this twice. Um, but there's a second part to that, and that is who's on my bench when Chris can't come to the meeting? Who else in the company can step up? And more importantly, if Chris were to get hit by a bus or take an opportunity that had him leave the organization he's with, who has the skills to not just come in and deliver, but to be able to say, I know that tomorrow's your son's birthday. I know all of these things that are about your culture and your organization. I'm like, that doesn't exist. I said, because the reality is in the space that we're all navigating right now, the resources are finite and you need to accept that right now you've got a limited resource that's giving you as much as they can, regardless of what that price tag is, what the value proposition is. So work through that time you have and take advantage of it as much as you can so that this respond recover model works for you in the time that you get. It's so, I'm sitting here listening as you're going through that. And anyone that knows me knows that I may talk about process an awful lot, but if you ask me to put them in place, we're all in a lot of trouble. Nothing's going to happen, right? That's that's not my world. I'll point out where we need them and then I'll have operations people um, like the ones on our staff, you know, yeah. work on those. But I, I continually come back and say, process is your safety net. Like, when all hell breaks loose, we don't always follow process, right? Where it's chaotic. We have to jump. We have to pull people. We're working crazy hours for clients, whatever it may be. In any chaotic situation, we don't, we don't all only go down the down staircase in a building if there's a fire on the floor above us. We right. just find the nearest set of stairs and go, right? right. We, we forget. Process is that safety net that we come back to when the situation comes down, when, when the chaos goes away, we go, wait a minute, let's take a breath. Let's realize if we go down this flight of stairs, instead of going right over there to the other set of stairs, right. the people trying to come up to fight the fire can't because there's a thousand of us flowing down this stairwell, right? And they can't do it. So, but that's a process that won't happen when smoke's coming in, right? And you're going, right. oh, oh, we got to get out of here. So, I continually point to those types of examples with our clients or our members and say, I'm not saying every process will be followed every step of the way all the time. I'm saying, if you don't have it in place, how do you get, how do you ever get out of the chaos? It's like uh, saying that you would like to be a web developer and you're going to take that intro to HTML class. It's essentially going to teach you how to write hello world. That's what it was 20 years ago. I'm not saying that's still the case. I know that you're never going to do that in real life, right? You're going to use tools that will build your page. But if you can write Hello World, you at least have an understanding. You have a, a workflow, if you will, to get that page to work. Uh, I think that that's where if you did it 10 times in a row, you at least have a template, right? So I know off the top of my head, and I'm, I haven't written a web page in years. I know that I need body tags and an HTML tag essentially a paragraph tag and it's going to write hello world and then it's going to display. Um, if I can memorize those pieces that make up that page, then similarly, we should be able to do the same thing with what we've got templated out for us already with the IT glues and the biz docs and all the other things. Now, if we take that and we start to use that as our go-to every time we get that inkling in our head, like I should probably have a process for that. How hard is it to write it down and make it available? I think that's where we fail. It's not that we aren't capable of doing it. It's that we just don't take the time to say, what does the exercise produce? We, we also, I like what you just said there. We don't identify where we need process and we don't accept that having something that isn't perfect is far better than having nothing. So and we try and get that nothing. perfect. Yeah, we end up with a lot of nothing. It's it. So I'll give you an example. I'm working with an MSP right now, and I hope they're actually listening. Uh, so I'm working with an MSP right now that I finally just said, write down what you do for addressing securing a workstation. Just write it down. 
I'm like, that's all I'm asking for. This is what we're going to consider to be a successful piece of addressing parts of control of that control. And he's like, I can do that. So two weeks go by. So I'm thinking this really isn't happening. He's like, I'm still working on it. So then he produces the said document. It's formatted. It's got these different, like who worked on it. I'm like, look, I really appreciate that you put this together and you really went way above and beyond. And I'll give you an A plus for effort, but I give you like a D minus for failing to get the point of the exercise, which was to just write down in notepad what you actually do. Because I said, we can make it beautiful and pretty later so that everybody understands what that's supposed to look like. But when you, when you fail to get it done in a timely manner, like say 45 minutes, well, you don't want to write another one because it took you two weeks. You, you've got it. You hit the nail right on the head. And, and the truth is someone else can make it pl- pretty and make sure the flow is right and double check and then come back to you and take you all that work that. off. It, well, and if we don't, if we don't, we can get right. admin help. It's not, not, to, not to belittle admin people, but that's their skill is taking a document, and making it look nice. Maybe a better right. way of saying is there are people for that and you can go spend five or $10 an hour and hire somebody to make documents look pretty, or you dump that text into an IT glue and it makes it look pretty. Yep. hundred percent. Copy paste. You know, 100%. it's funny. Uh, you know, you're, you were talking about the staircase and I have to, I, I actually lost an opportunity uh, in the one world trade center in long beach in that building. Uh, I had read the number wrong for the address that we were going to and we got on the wrong bank of elevators. So once you're on the wrong bank of elevators, you got to go all the way back down, get on the right bank of elevators and go up. We were 15 minutes late to our meeting, just in the building. And lost out. Lost out because we didn't truly to pay attention to the detail on what would have been a great process to exercise. <laughs> like, let's go in there and deliver. Right. We missed the first 10% because we weren't paying close enough attention. I, I really think that 90 percent of what we struggle with in the industry is that is it's going to take me so long to create this perfect document, and as you said, no no one asked you for the perfect document. Just give us a list. Just, just yeah. give us a list. It, it's funny because if you think about uh, building a house or building anything, really, you know, you start out with some sort of drawing, some sort of blueprint, and I think by and large, we've got the tools that give us the blueprint, whether it's a framework. CIS top 20, um, you've got the tools that you use, like the AutoCAD, the drawing software, whatever you want to call it, is our IT glues and some of these other things, or even just as simple as a Word doc template that you got from, uh, you know, Secure Outcomes. So the real question, I think, as we kind of circle back to this is, what do we need to do? And I'm going to say that this is for the MSP, you know, channel at large, but I, I feel like I have, we have more of touch points within MSP Ignite. And that is, how do we help MSPs say, I want to spend some time in response recover, because I know if I spend time there, it's going to allow me to do a better job in identifying, detecting, and protecting both me and my clients. I think the only way to do it is to actually put some exercises in place, almost like a mini case study that we put out to to certainly to our peer group members, you know, and then we can go from there to, to the greater and say, if you want to come up with some documents to help your industry, yep. read this case study and put policies in place. Just list the tasks. When this happened at the client, here's the tasks we should follow. When this happened, here's the tasks we should follow. Maybe there's four or five different areas like that and just list the tasks. I think you just gave me homework because I think, in fact, we may already have the case study. Uh, So the Security Advisory Council for Secure Outcomes, one of the things that we did is we stepped through the controls one through six and we met every week and we talked about what do we need to tell MSPs? How do we go about doing this? And I kid you not, I feel like, you know, as far as being hypocritical here, I struggled with writing policies too, right? I could look at the template. I'm getting paralysis analysis going. I can't even help you fill in this policy. Uh, how, how am I going to ever be successful with, with my own clients? And what really was the turning point was look at what needs to be done as far as evidence to prove that you have process and workflows that address those controls 
then you understand the policy's mindset so you can make it your own. The, the five members of the advisory council that went through this, I can tell you that two of them have completed all six controls. And one of them is so far into control three on a depth that is no, just mind boggling because they recognized that if they just put down the workflow that addresses the controls, they suddenly have the makings of a real framework that is their own. So not to say we, we, we don't need some work here to actually share it with the, you know, the, the community of MSP Ignite and then maybe on a larger scale, but yeah, it's, it's the doing part that we, we need to show more, more effectively. As soon as you said that maybe we, maybe we just have to do some work to have something that can share, we could share, I get nervous. We see this all the time, but um, we talk financials a lot, obviously. And, and people are always like, just give us what the chart of accounts should look like, or give us this, or give us that. And I always say, but we're not helping you understand when we do all those things. We're just helping you report to us. And, sure. meet our, and I think it's the same. If we, if we start handing out, here's what someone else came up with. And I got this from you, by the way, Chris. They're losing out on the exercise of actually understanding what steps they need to take and what they're capable of taking. Let me phrase it a different way because maybe I said this wrong. I think the, the evidence that we share isn't the actual final product. The evidence that we share is these are the steps that said MSP went through to address parts of control one. This is the exercise that they went through. I think the exercise is something that can be uh, repeated by any MSP. There's no snowflake on that front, right? right? The actual policy that may come out of all of this is going to be a snowflake. So when people ask me, Chris, can you just give me a template? I'm extremely hesitant to do that because we found that by and large, if I give you the policy template, you have no idea what that policy is telling you to do. And there's some good reasons there, right? Like if I have an auditor come in and they look at a policy that's rather vague, maybe full of some ambiguity that is ambiguity so that I'm not creating a new policy every 45 days because for the third time this month, I've changed my AV vendor, uh, you know, that would change my policy. That would be a red flag for an auditor. So we went through this and said, okay, let's have an actual workflow that identifies when I secure an in a workstation, that I go through these steps and I put insert vendor here for whatever the product is that we've put into place. Now that's not in the policy, right? The policy references that piece. But now when I look at that policy, I totally understand because I made it my own and I didn't have to get into detail in the policy as to what was actually happening and they can embrace it and understand it. So I don't want people to write policies. In fact, I think policies are, I'm going to say this on the podcast. I think policies are stupid because you have to understand the controls that you're trying to satisfy before a policy will mean anything to you. And as it's been said, how many times policies are boring? I love it. I All think right, you've Steve. the world's problems in the MSP space. All right. Hey, if we can solve some problems, I'm happy with that. So Steve, is there any final uh, that you would like to share with, with the audience that says, hey, uh, check out MSP Ignite. I always like to say that. Um, I like to thank our sponsor this month with VCIO Toolbox. Steve, what's your last thoughts? So I appreciate that, Chris. We believe that every business owner, every manager needs a place, a safe place to go talk and get advice, share challenges and get advice. Um, we call that peer groups. We'd love to see anyone that's listening to come check it out, reach out to us, talk to us a little bit about it at uh, msp-ignite.com. Um, and really, Chris, I want to thank you because your involvement with our audience, um, with our membership on our Secure Outcomes Initiative has made a huge difference. Thanks, Steve. With that, hope you enjoy the rest of your week and stay tuned for the next episode of MSP 1337. Bye.